Well, I just wanted to speak very briefly um, um, by way of introduction to Panina, who many of you know in many contexts, but may not know her um, scholarly work. Um, as I said, she and Miriam wrote a book together called Unequal Colleagues about women's entrance into the profession. And in that book, they note that even if women professionals, these are early women professionals in the early part of the 20th century, even if they were super achievers or innovators, they were likely not to have gained the respect of their male <coughs> colleagues who consistently didn't promote them or worse still fired them. So that's one very completely contrary to the central ideology of the professions, which is that they are meritocratic, an ideology that precisely functions to cover the kinds of exclusions that they documented. But the other point that I think is sometimes less commented upon and one that they emphasize is that even if they survived themselves, these early women pioneers, they were unable to create space for other women, for another generation that would come behind them. And that was the work that Miriam and Panina devoted themselves to. That is to say, the work of mentoring younger women and creating a space for us. And I've often thought, um, Gloria Naylor, the African-American writer, once said to Toni Morrison, when I was coming up, you were there for me. But when you were coming up, there was no you. So who was there for you, and how did you do it? So this is a question that I, I, I have for um, Panina. Um, our second speaker is going to be Patty Kleindienst, who came in 1971. She said this was the third college she attended. <laughs> <laughs> so some traditions, some traditions. Continue. She knew she was going to blossom somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> um, and when she was still in graduate school, she published feminist reinterpretations of classical myths and biblical stories, which she told me just a while ago. Actually, that's her most famous article, is the one she published in graduate school. Her first book was a winner of the 2007 American Book Award, The Earth Knows My Name. And it tells the story of 15 ethnic Americans who transmit their cultural heritage through their gardens. And she's going to speak tomorrow about African-American gardens, um, especially speaking about the Gullah. So none of us can navigate this program. But if you study it, you will find out. <laughs> it's three o'clock somewhere. Three o'clock somewhere. Um, and finally, um, I've invited Jess Wu, who just graduated in 2010, though she is the class of fall 2006. I've always thought that Hampshire and with this extraordinary practice of naming you by when you come, not when you leave, has little faith that <laughs> 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 you will reach the end. But, um, <laughs> Jess um, has just completed her Division Three, a psychoanalytic critique of American national identity. And she's going to talk about her experience um, at Hampshire. Um, I just, just want to um, say two more things before I turn the panel over. And, and that is to underline that, as I said, feminist studies here has always seen itself as connected to feminist movements. And one of the ways that that's been possible is that we have a fabulous program here on campus called the Civil Liberties and Public Pol Policy Program, which you may not know by its name, is a reproductive rights activist. <laughs> which Adele is laughing because there was clearly, um, there's a wonderful story about fundraising which we would be happy to tell. Um, uh, but anyway, that, that, and I've often told my students, and if any of you should be around in April, they have an extraordinary conference every April of a thousand reproductive rights activists. That used to be women, but now it's people of many genders who come not only from all over the country, but all over the world. And it's a way to have an experience of the early women's movement, if you not want, that still lives. And we also have what's now called the Center for Feminisms. And we also have very early on a woman president, Adele Simmons. And Miriam and Miriam. day before the Ivies caught on and began to hire women presidents. And I remember well, he was with the woman <coughs> dean of the faculty, and I expect that more cop business was done in the ladies' room here than <laughs> 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 I mean, I've often told um, Adele that and she knows the 
is Daniel Bell, the famous sociologist, once said to me, oh, you're at Hampshire, you've got that girl at the end. <laughs> and he got very nervous and he said, and when she was interviewed, she had one of her babies there and she put the baby in the file cabinet. <laughs> Undoubtedly apocryphal, but you can make it suggestive nonetheless. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Lena. This is the most fun. <coughs> I just love being here with all of you. I think it's, it's terrific. Um, and so I thought about, you know, five minutes. What am I going to say? Now, Miriam is not here. Uh, as Margaret said, she wasn't feeling well today. And so now I feel sort of, I don't know what she was going to say, but I somehow feel obliged to sort of imagine what she was going to say. Uh, to to channel that in as well. Right, <laughs> to, cha to channel her. So I just wanted to explain a little bit about what happened when the college opened. The college <coughs> opened in 1970. It was new, it was innovative, it was experimental. Everybody was young. We were young. Um, <laughs> uh, and very enthusiastic about the options and the possibilities for change. There were a few women who were hired in um, that opening cohort. Um, but the most, I think, important point to realize is that never was gender a category of analysis. Nobody thought about it as something that ought to be looked at, whether it was about hiring or student experience or the curriculum or anything else. And so a few young women who were here sort of looked around and said, you know, there is an emerging women's movement in the country in its infancy to be sure, but nevertheless present. And this is not reflected at this new experimental college. And so we have to change that. And the changes began in a rather <laughs> systematic way. The first thing was saying, we need to have more women's voices in the faculty and in the administration um, because there were very, very few. It was just sort of naturally led by men. And um, so the first, the first major hiring that was, was for the second housemaster. The first housemaster was David Smith at Merrill House. And then they were going to hire almost immediately a second housemaster. And so this small group of people who began to have sort of strong feelings about that said, well, we need to have a, a, women, a woman uh, housemaster. And so then begins, you know, these discussions about, well, then you can't call it housemaster. <laughs> you really want to have a housemistress. <laughs> We overcame all of that, never one to be trampled on by trivia. And, um, and, and Miriam was hired as the, as, and that was a, a stroke of genius, not just because she's my friend and colleague over many years, but because she really understood how that worked. Partly out of her own autobiographical experience, partly she was on the cutting edge of some of the things were going on, she knew Adele from uh, organizations they were in together in, in, in the 70s. Um, but she was quick to cut through, you know, what you might say, cut through the crap and say, well, we don't care whether it's called housemaster or housemistress. That's not what it's about. And then uh, more women faculty were, and uh, administrators, but especially faculty were hired to work. Some of those were really important. Some of them are sitting in this room. But especially, the, there were very important um, appointments in natural science because that was the gateway to making the case that uh, science was you know, the real field. The women can do it. The real Some field. <coughs> um, <coughs> um, don't, don't do that. And even if you hire women scientists, they're going to do the same science because science is so neutral. Um, and people like Merle and Nancy Lowry and uh, Andrew Hope, they 
they gave the lie to a lot of those things. Um, the second thing that happened was that the notion that the curriculum had to change. And Margaret alluded to some of the really important things that went on there, because the question was, I found, by the way, my syllabus from the first course I ever did. Wow. 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 In this wow. purple ditto wow. that I saw. Wow. 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 You know your age and you know what this purple ditto is. <laughs> but um, the, the, the argument that was going around everywhere was whether or not to fight for a women's studies department. And not only did it have to do with the name feminist versus uh, women's studies, but it had to do with this notion of whether or not we would have a department. And there was a consensus among the, the people who were thinking about this and beginning to realize that gender was a category of analysis, that that would not be a good thing. That by becoming a department, you would, first of all, we didn't have <laughs> so that would be a problem. <laughs> Secondly, even by becoming a program, you would, in a way, give way to a kind of structural marginalization. And that what our aim was, was to have feminist analysis permeate the curriculum. And you know what? We did a pretty damn good job of that. It yes. took a long time. It wasn't only taught by women. It wasn't only taught by feminists. But everywhere throughout the curriculum, we began to realize that this was something that had to be looked at, as did, as was class and race and a whole lot of other very, very important things. So um, Miriam and Gail Hollander and I gave what we think was one of the very first courses on the history of women in America. It was an interdisciplinary course in the second phase, I think it was, that Patty taught a section to, and um, we were, uh, we think it came to, to kind of just sort of spearhead many more important things. What I want to say, the last thing, is that there was very little literature at the time. The literature that was coming out, I mean, of course, there were some classics coming out, like Simone de Beauvoir, Second Sex, but the stuff that was coming out was in an early stage of a field that had no theory, that had no, no building blocks to build on. So there was a lot of finding lost women in history and doing some important biographies. But slowly that began to change. And the thing that we realized is that we have to participate in that. And we have to be part of that feminist scholarship as well. And in that way, one of the things I think that Miriam and I try to point out in our book is that this generation was different from the one that <coughs> preceded it, that we really wanted to look at that experience and analyze it and make sense of it. So the very last thing is that after the scholarship, the curriculum, the, the higher, people began to look for institutions, a women's or center, a place that people could go. Um, a daycare center, I saw Barbara walk in and that Barbara was so instrumental in trying to get off the ground because you have to think about what was the experience that people would have if they came to work here and how they would negotiate all those things. Finally, I want to say that in 1977 when Adele arrived, nine months pregnant, after all, not having many babies on the file cabinet, carrying this baby with her. No place was more ready than Hampshire College to uh, have this woman become our leader. And she and I remarked over lunch what a remarkable thing it was that the chairman of our board, John Kendall, at that time, the least likely person, you think, to hire a woman who was 36 years old and in her ninth month, he said, she looks great, let's go for it. Um, and so we went for it. And I went. The word I want to um, suggest to you all is exuberance. And I think that Panina captured some of that exuberance of the sense that we were beginning something 
um, fresh and new. And as I was trying to prepare for today, Googling around, I found a description of the first course on Asian American women at UCLA in 1972, presented in the experimental college because it didn't have a legitimate place yet in the curriculum. And this is the description. Faced with a paucity of literature dealing directly with Asian American women, the team of instructors themselves learning as they taught, assembled readings on women and social movements in Vietnam, China, and Japan. They also called on grassroots women, those lost women, to share their life stories, conducted class meetings at sites such as the Asian Women's Center and the Filipino Community Center, and solicited community <coughs> members' attendance. And I, I suggest that because I want to recommend that you all go tomorrow at 11 o'clock to see Joan Bratterman's film, The Heretics, which captures that sense of exuberance. It's about the part, an early feminist collective that started a magazine called Heresies that tried to, um, tried to explain why women were not, why there were no great women artists and how they were going to become recognized as artists. So it captures that moment of early exuberance, which I think is also what Patty wants to <laughs> share from our conversation. But are there people that are there people no. who don't no. have them? No. Okay. There's, 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 there's other places over there. Yeah. 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 Well <laughs> it's um I'm very sorry you're even here. It's wonderful to hear you speak. I could sit here and listen all day. Um, I I don't know how I can possibly say it in five minutes either, but I'll I'll try. And then we're doing we're doing questions and answers afterwards. Okay. Um, first of all, I have to say how wonderful it is to see all these faces. And, and, um, Hampshire is where I found my voice, and I found my subject, and I found my location. And I'm already getting ready to cry. And I found it through being invited to teach the literature section of the interdisciplinary course that Miriam Payne up and Dale taught. They didn't have somebody to teach the literature section, so my work study job my second year here when I was a fellow, was to teach. And um, it was a kind of tr trust. They just handed it to me. I designed it myself. Holly Longsworth, the first co-president of Hampshire College, <laughs> 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 influential in helping me design the Emily Dickinson course, that course. And so I had 10 undergraduates to teach in that class. And <coughs> to part in those discussions. Um, so I want to think aloud a little bit and, and remember some things aloud and then invite questions and comments. Um, it was quite extraordinary to come here. I wanted to come to Hampshire the minute I heard about it in high school, but I had to, I graduated in 69, it didn't open until 70. I needed to get out of you know, everything. Hi, Bob. <laughs> and so, you know, Hampshire had a record. They didn't have a book, remember? There was a record. And you said, it's like the little, the little engine that could, like a little plastic record you put on your record player. And some of you probably have never seen a record player. <laughs> and uh, my creative writing teacher in high school said, you've got to listen to this record. This is the place for you. And then they did have a little pamphlet. And it was heartbreaking because I looked at the Smith, Mount Holyoke, Amherst, UMass connection and thought, there's no way in hell I can go to this school. Economically, there's no way. Certainly, these people are just, I was so intimidated by the elite, it was the elitist panache, and I, but I ached inside. So the reason it took me several frog leaps to get here <laughs> was that I always knew I wanted to be here. And I had to finally be so disappointed in conventional academia that it was either going to an archaeological dig in Mexico or coming to Hampshire. Um, and then I got in, but I didn't get enough money, so I wrote them a letter. And I said, I can't come unless you give me more money. So they gave me more money. <laughs> and then they gave me a job. And when I got here, thank God, in a way, I got here the year Miriam was here because I was in Dakin House and she was my master. And this is, I'm not going to go in chronological sequence, I just have to say that I no longer have my formal Hampshire diploma, which at that point was redesigned every year. <laughs> it wasn't one. What I have is my hallmark diploma that Miriam and Paul Slater gave me, signed by the Master of Dakin House and the Mister of Dakin <laughs> <laughs> So when I arrived, there was a reception for students at Dakin House, and I went into the living room, and Miriam came right up to me. I was probably quivering, and she took my hands and she said, I have to shake your hand. Anyone who could get from Mom Monmouth College to 
I have to shake your hand. And um, okay, um <laughs> yeah, she had taught for a year at Mom. And Miriam understood who I was and where I came from. The first member of my family to go to college. Um, so I, what I would say is that it is there's no way to separate out the birth of feminism here from an encounter like that. That is the sense of coming here and being understood and being welcomed and somebody understanding the context. So that was the beginning. Um, and I studied literature, and I might have been the first person to do women in fiction at Hampshire. I don't know. That was my division three. It was one of the first, anyway. And I had a five college committee. I had Leo Marx up at Amherst, mm -hmm. and uh, Morian Adams at Smith on my committee, and John Gallagher and David Smith. And, <laughs> and um, it was a huge committee, and it was quite controversial, and it was quite amazing and experience. But I have to say that the birth of feminist consciousness happened for us simultaneously, students and teachers. And that was what was thrilling and terrifying about it once. And they were, I think, what enabled me in my career as a writer and as a teacher, because I went on to go to Stanford in Modern Thought and Literature, which is the program closest to Hampshire in the entire country. And then I was hired to teach at Yale, God help me, um, which didn't have a feminist studies program. But I always called my, I always said that I taught feminist studies, even though they called it women's studies. It's now, and they did exactly what you said Hampshire didn't do. It went from women's to gender, to women's gender, gay, transsexual, and you know, it's like, it's got five million initials. But I, but what I learned here was that revolution in consciousness, that is, gender as a mode of analysis, you could use Archimedes' lever of gender to lift any stone, to shift anything on his axis. And the emotional shock, the sort of psychological shock waves that were sent through all of us by discovering these questions, it's hard to recapture that. It was exciting, it was exhilarating, but it was also unnerving. And the boundaries between personal experience and intellectual experience dissolved because this quality of engagement with one's life and one's origin and the very question and that the idea that your body is part of your learning. You know, to know is not enough, but you have to know who you are, what body is doing that learning. So um, I want to talk for a moment about something I wrote to the group about on um, we were asked some of our memories. So I want to talk about a meeting. I don't know who organized it. Was it you and Miriam? There was a meeting in the Howard Johnson. Howard Johnson. Harold Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> and it was mostly undergraduates and some faculty. And it was about race. And there was a lot of anguish and anger among black undergraduate students. I don't know if anybody in this room was there. Yeah. Um, but there was an extremely painful encounter, and it became a confrontation. And I remember Miriam. Um, mediating some of this, which was some of the black women in the room basically saying, your feminism is for white women only. It doesn't speak to us. It doesn't address our needs, our questions, our suffering, our position in life. And this was very scary. But part of the Hampshire experience and part of learning feminist praxis as not something you put on in the morning, oh my god, your feet I taught Dana how to think like one. <laughs> and so there was this there was this gathering, and one of the things I distinctly remember one of the black young black women saying is, um, we want, we want to make pies for our husbands. And what she was talking about was the way the 60s welfare program had destroyed the black family. You got more money if there was no black husband in the house. And they actually checked on you. And it was years before I put all this together. But Hampshire created a safe place for that kind of very charged, delicate, dangerous encounter. So that the other part of it was that we could learn to listen to each other. It was not just learning to ask kind of question. None of us had a language for it. We were all finding our voices, but learning to hear each other without being so afraid. And I, I, I somehow that moment stayed with me because it's so practical. You know, it's so poignant. The idea of, you know, before you want to explode the idea of marriage, maybe some of us want access. 
to Oscar, to the experience of a stable home, uh, to the, the sort of continuity of generations that black families have been deprived of for so long. And that was profound. And there wasn't much literature on that. And that was part of the Hampshire experience. It came out of a weird question. It was a costly, personal question. And so I guess what I would end with, because I'm probably over five minutes, is that the revolutionary part of Hampshire for me was I lived in a state of terror most of my two years. <laughs> um, for many, many reasons we can talk about. But it was the simultaneous shaking of the ground under my feet and being held. And uh, what I would close with is homage to Miriam and Tanina. I'm trying to say this without crying. Their friendship was a model of collegiality and intellectual excellence and brilliance I've never encountered in my life. Nobody in my family had come to me before. And you know, I brought with me my dog ear to Rumo Bonzo, which I read for the first time downstairs. <laughs> this is the very copy. Um, when there's this amazing line, you know, here I am having this, I'm going to come back to you, I promise, but one of the things she said is, you know, this whole myth that women don't like women. <coughs> women can't be friends. Um, and so she says at one point, you know, literature has been be impoverished beyond our counting by the doors that have been closed upon women. So here I am experiencing this revolution, and then I'm sitting in the chair by myself. I didn't get up to pee, eat, or drink water, and my friends know that's quite something for me. <laughs> um, but then she said, we all know that great literature never emerges from the working classes. And it was like a knife in my heart. And so here I was discovering my subject and my mentor and feeling utterly undercut and betrayed at the same time. And it was knowing Miriam and Panina that helped me find a way to make sense of that. And your friendship, you took me to lunch a lot, the two of you. <laughs> and, um, you let me, I don't, I, you know, now I look back and I think, you did that on purpose. Um, but they all, you also invited me to give a talk. I don't want to remember the class. Mm -hmm. And that's when I found my voice as a lecturer. Then I went on to give that Leo Marxist class where I was one of two women in the So. They I needed it. They needed it. <laughs> they did need it. And at my Division three, David will remember this. Remember, Leo leaned over and said to me at the end, um, we were talking about to the lighthouse and Mr. Ramsey, and he, he sort of gently put his hand on my arm. He said, now that it's all over, I really have to ask you, are we men really like that? <laughs> <laughs> because I think it's utterly critical to what's happened to feminism since those early days is the recognition that gender can't be an exclusive category of analysis. And that the early discussions and debates um, among feminists were among, we discovered to ourselves, among white women. And there <coughs> began that very long process, which happened both through texts and through meetings and confrontations, of our, as white women, beginning not only to see the other, but to see ourselves as the other saw us, and to begin to imagine forms of identification that were not based on sameness. And so I would say that, that in some ways, one might see that as the kind of subsequent trajectory of feminism. And that's something like the feminism that you came into by the time you came to have. So, Jess. <laughs> Um, first off, I want to say that I'm really honored to even sit here with such inspiring um, professors here. <laughs> and um, I'm sitting here because Professor Sulu asked me to talk a little bit on my perspective on feminism, which um, is strongly rooted in the idea that the personal is the political. Um, I'm part of the entering class of spring 2006, and I'm a recent grad from Hampshire College now. Um, while I was a student here, my main focus was on psychoanalysis, political philosophy, and Asian American studies. Um, and my did three was a psychoanalytic critique of American national identity, where I explored the use of um, a psychoanalytic framework with Amer American political identity and history. Um, much of my interpretation used, psychoanal um, used psychoanalytic theory in a, in a feminist perspective. I was influenced by um, Jessica Benjamin, Judith Butler, and Jacqueline Rose, who understand the importance of recognizing how structures of oppression are reproduced in the family. 
Um, and I believe that the work of psychoanalysis is, is a confrontation of political and social manifestations of power that exists within in yourself and oneself and um, within one's actions. And that psychoanalytic work has the ability to de deconstruct structures of oppression and attack the source of domination. Um, so in this way, my, my interests lie in the work on the level of the individual and how it's linked to political work and political struggle. Um, for me, feminism is is a struggle that occurs very much in the lived experience, um, and I believe that it's it's powerfully demonstrated and spoken about in in the lives and words through the very lived experiences of individuals, um, and especially for women of color who live in a society who that so much wants to erase us and deny us our histories and <laughs> beat us to the ground through exploitation and oppression that the very fact of survival itself in living <laughs> in life itself is often considered an act of resistance. Um, so in the context of my own, own personal experiences at Hampshire, um, I believe feminism has thrived in the particular way that um, the women of color and student of color mods exist on this campus. Um, I lived in the Women of Color Mod in 2008 to 2009 and Student of Color Mod in 2009 to 2010, um, which became a second Women of Color Mod, which I'm really excited <laughs> that year. Um, <laughs> it, was, it, was, and it was a really empowering experience for me and I wanted to share that today um, because I, I believe that it represented a place um, where the existence of multiplicity and um, respected differences and the lived act of resistance through survival took place. Um, and for that, I'm really grateful and lucky to have had the ability to call that my home for two, two years. And I had been through a lot <laughs> in my first two years, which brought me to those spaces. Um, so, um, and I learned a lot from the women that I lived with who were all from different backgrounds and experiences. Um, and even though, you know, we. We, we all had different like focuses of study and, and different backgrounds and everything. Um, we came together under under this household, under the common premise that a uh, political, personal experience of struggle exists within us. And um, so, thinking back at my time on at Hampshire, I I don't think I really could have survived <laughs> this place. Um, <laughs> I kind of lived there. I mean, it was it was a safe space. It was home. Um, and you know, college is a really daunting task, especially at Hampshire. Where, um, well, you know, they know. <laughs> you guys know. <laughs> it's, a really, it's a really daunting task, and I, I'm 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 comforted by the fact that there was a support system like that, and it was empowering, knowing that there are other women who are going through the same experiences who share a similar um, bodily experience, like and visible, you know. Um, uh, so these ex uh, the existence of of the space is really important to me, and um, but I'd like to just note that these these aren't permanent spaces on campus, and that uh, they have to be fought for <laughs> every single year. <laughs> um, but I I wanted to relate that to um, to the feminist ideology because because feminism shouldn't only co be considered as a movement against sex and equality, and it's a struggle against all forms of domination, and because because all forms of domination are formed by and operate alongside one another. Um, issues of race and class, sexual orientation, as well as gender needs to be considered. Um, and so I think that um, the tra trajectory of feminism needs to con conceptualize a great multiplicity in the expressions of what we call feminism. And, um, we need to work on many different fronts, um, even though, like, for example, that the women of color and student of color mods are, are mostly um, fought for within the cultural center and the source community. I think other other forces need to join together and discuss these things and, and fight for it on this campus. And Hampshire is a space where we can, we can really um, fight for politi like, <laughs> political <laughs> And it, it exists as a microcosm. So. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's really open, <coughs> and I, um, I maybe we'll listen to one or 
to questions or comments, and then, yeah. Um, I got, like, questions and comments. One, uh, <laughs> 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 only one or two. <laughs> 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 so why don't you tell everybody who you are? Uh, my name is Sandy Wolofsky. I'm Fall 87, and um, I'm a journalist based, I guess, right now out of Montreal. Today, out of Montreal. Um, uh, for Penny, I'm not as smart as you guys. I just bring it down to simple stuff. They let me in here by accident. So um, I wanted to, I, I was, that's my advisor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the one thing I just wanted to say to Penina was that I thought you should bring up was I have a very distinct memory of you making comment. I guess I'm the same year as, as your son went off to college. And you came back and you made a statement about, uh, I guess he came home at one point and you were discussing how you and Panina banter off each other. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, you and Miriam banter off each other and you like interrupt each other. And that your son, I guess, was it Brandeis? Mm -hmm. um, Good memory. They let me in here. Um, <laughs> um, so he, he was surprised and I was, I, as I was listening to you talk about you and Miriam, and you know, subsequent all my other sort of experiences in life, there was something very unique about watching you and Miriam team teach. And it wasn't, uh, okay, here I teach now, and now you teach. Here I teach, now you teach. Which not too many Hampshire people did. I mean, you and Bob didn't do that either, but nobody. It was like watching an old married couple. <laughs> <laughs> so that's one. Number two that I thought is really important to add to this discussion, it comes directly from the world of journalism, which is two things. One, there was a huge thing in Canada this year about the fact that um, a, a person revealed that they they file stories under two different names. One is male, one female. Mm -hmm. And she makes like three times as much under her mm -hmm. male name. <coughs> and the other story that um, we just had a Canadian Association of Journalists conference, and they tried to bring these people from DC. And I'm bringing this out because I'm hoping someone knows who these people are. Apparently, there's a group in DC that is working to uh, encourage women who write op-eds and to try to get more female op-eds published because statistically, you know, they're like 98.9% .9 of the op-eds published are, are male. And we tried to bring these people to this conference and it didn't work. So if anyone knows who they are, <laughs> <laughs> well, I know of them. I don't know them by name. Yeah. Right, well, you know who to get in touch with, Adele. Um, first of all, I've just been through lots of scrapbooks, and there were lots of op-eds written by women in Hampshire in the 70s, so we, we were trying to change it. A couple of comments. Um, I came here from Princeton. I was the first woman senior officer there. The group of alumni that Sam Alito was a part of assigned someone to follow me around. <laughs> for me, wait for me to make a mistake. Once I dropped something and said a very kind four-letter word, the one that begins with an S, it was headlines saying, Dean Simmons needs to be fired. Uh, so it was from that environment that I came to Hampshire with two children under two. And I cannot tell you what the welcome and the space and the kind of place it was like meant to me personally. So I'm going to fast forward because I just gave a speech to Princeton alum because it's their 40th anniversary of co-education. <laughs> <laughs> In that process, I learned something about Princeton women today. There are fewer women today getting major scholarships than before. The candidates for women class, freshman class president are all men, seven of them. Women are basically not <coughs> seeking out or participating in the leadership of the university. And there is now, with Shirley Tillman, you, oh my God, if you think about yeah. the amazing woman, yes. there's yeah. now a, a task force that's kind of trying to figure out what's going on that Nancy Philhain is chairing. But in all of that, we're now dealing with this whole focus on choice feminism, a re-emphasis a, a re on feminism. And I'm really interested in hearing from Margaret a little bit about Hampshire, which I suspect is <coughs> reacting to this, and what you're seeing with women today. Well, you know, Hampshire's very peculiar, I think. <laughs> <laughs> no, but but Penina made the point that we decided not to have a women's studies 
yeah. program as such, and I, it's a very risky endeavor, this endeavor, this idea of feminism permeating throughout the curriculum, because it's very easy for it to be lost, and the, but it hasn't been. And I, you know, and I think that the secret is that we do keep hiring. I would say that an invisible criterion for whom we hire is that people be not actively anti-feminist, whether they be male or whatever. So the courses that are called, for example, just to take a few that I teach, Cultures of U.S. Foreign Policy, Post-Modernity in Politics, much to the surprise of a lot of the young male students who take those courses, are also feminist courses, and that, and it's not just me. I think that's true. You know, I'm looking, you know, at anybody you see here. I don't know. There are others here who might want to speak to that, but in some, and maybe you can, Jess. But I feel as though a feminist, that feminism has per pervaded the culture here, and I, I ran into, um, I ran into a former student of mine in the cafe in Cambridge about um, two or three weeks ago. Was at Harvard in sociology, and she's studying the Medco program, very interesting program, very important, which was one of the few surviving um, busing programs between the inner city and the suburbs, suburbs right? They, the rest of them were <coughs> destroyed by the Supreme Court. And she said to me, it's a real Hampshire um, PhD. She said it's about sex, gender, and class. And of course, what most people would think of studying is achievement. Etc. What happens to those graduates afterwards? She's studying what was the differential experience of boys and girls when they came from the inner city and went to the suburbs, and discovering that the boys were wildly popular and the girls were wildly unpopular and had no one to date. And I'm quite fascinating, but as she said, and I was very moved to hear it, it's a very Hampshire conceptualization because it keeps questions of race, gender, and class at the center and together. But I don't know, I mean, there are other people here, Jess and Barbara, and Elizabeth, and I've watched you, Lise. Elizabeth, Lisa, and, yeah. Elizabeth, Lisa, and Michelle yeah. are all relatively new faculty. And I'm curious about what, sort of what your experience has been, whether you feel that any of this is still real. And I love well, I would love to just speak a bit to what Margaret mentioned. I'm Lee Sanders. I came as a student, as a transfer student in 1990, and then came back and have been teaching at the college since uh, 1999. Um, and I was very much mentored by feminist faculty as a student here. So I came in specifically wanting to do women's studies from UCLA, where I had been you know, one among many, um, trying to find my voice, and very much found that here, mentored by people like Mary Rousseau and Sora Levine, who served on my Division Three committee, and then coming back, I think the experience of being mentored as well by faculty like Brown and Margaret and Tamina and others um, throughout the years of teaching here, I think that's so key to Hampshire's approach to feminism. And I would also link it to things like the multiple uh, cultural perspectives requirement, which has been, it's the new, um, or not maybe not so new now, um, way that we have of framing the third world expectation that students do in Division Two. Um, but is so crucial, I think, to the way that students conceive their work, to, to the way that faculty can see their courses. And I think there's something along those lines in the incorporation of feminism, as you say, in courses here. And I also think that the spirit of mentorship very much speaks to Jessica's comments about the need to continue to fight for these institutions on campus, the history of the Women's Center and now the Center for Feminism has um, and spoken to that, um, the importance of that continuing conversation, leadership of older students, um, by older students toward younger students, et cetera. So that's really been key. And Ellie and Lynn teach feminist fiction, so I don't know, which is um, a course that a lot of first year students at Hampshire pass through. So I don't know if you want to. Elizabeth's work in natural science. Oh, and Elizabeth? I'm sorry, I can yeah. barely oh, see from here. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I'm Elizabeth Connell, I teach epidemiology and public health. And I came in 2000 and was um, mentored very lovingly by um, Ann McNeil and Nancy Lowry and Merle and Deb Martin, who have all left. And we now have fewer female faculty in NS than ever. We're down to five. Um, we have three terrific new hires, but they're very junior. And it's a, it's a struggle. I think we're kind of maybe back where you were in the 70s, and even, um, I mean, Merle and, and Nancy have characterized it as such in terms of having to build and convince and make our case. So, um, 
this is something I learned from Panina and Mirhe because back in the day, those of us who were socialist feminists thought that um, affirmative action was bourgeois. And then you did, <laughs> then you did then what was the big deal about getting more women into positions of exploitation, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, but what they always, they always insisted that you pay attention and said, if you don't pay attention, you will lose ground. Mm -hmm. And I remember when Adele um, re retired, resigned rather, and was replaced by a male president. You said, and at that point it was true. The number, the percentage of women president, college presidents in the country has gone down significantly, and that's a loss. Mm -hmm. We have to watch that. And I, I think that, yeah, I think it remains. That's the lesson that I. That's one of the lessons I've taken. That if we're not vigilant all the time, and always counting numbers and looking, um, both at the level of gender and certainly at the level of race, it it just goes. So I don't know if others. Well, I think feminism is still very much a part of the curriculum. But when I arrived, um, I'm Lynn Hanley, uh, and I've been teaching here 25 years, 30 years. Um, I came shortly after Adele, actually, also from Princeton. Um, but when I arrived, Adele was president and Tony Miller's dean of faculty. And I regret to say that has never happened since. Mm -hmm. And it's happening less and less. Our higher administration is almost all male. Uh, and I think that's a real loss for future. It's hard to it's hard to to um, keep it. Yeah. The reason other? the reason that Miriam and I focused on that so much when we did the research on unequal <coughs> colleagues, there was a great movement for <coughs> women to enter the professions at the turn of the century, and it continues, say, you know, through the tw uh, through the suffrage movement through the nineteen twenties. And the women were so certain at that time that, okay, that's it, it's over. Women have been accepted to the male medical school, so we can close down the women's medical colleges, and all but one uh, in the country closed down, and a whole series of other institutional choices like that. But what happened then is the tap got turned off, and by you know 1940 or so, only 5% of women entering medical school, only 5% of medical school entrants were, were women. And there was, we encountered many, a lot of evidence of that kind, and it becomes very clear that you never win any victories forever, mm -hmm. uh, whatever they might be, as you look for equality in the world. It's, uh, social justice is something that you just keep fighting for forever. You know, I heard Elizabeth Warren, my new culture hero, and I imagine <laughs> yours as well, who's um, the other day on the radio, and um, the commentator was saying, well, there are now three women in very important positions, you and Sheila Bayer, and I don't know who the other one is. What do you think that indicates? And I thought he was going to say, you know, that women bring something really courageous and critical and unrelenting. He said, no. He said, there's progress, right? And it's all basically, and we don't have to worry about it anymore. And she said, I just have to tell you that there's never a line to get into the women's bathroom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so there's something about bathroom politics. <laughs> um, yes. Alan Sturgis of 77, and what, one of the things that I learned, particularly from the two of you and from Miriam, um, which I don't think I really appreciated until after I graduated, was that I took, I think most of Margaret's classes, you know, comparative social development, and you know, really radical thinking, and, and the feminism piece was certainly built into it, but I think maybe my first class was with Miriam and Panina was the, the women in professions, which I still think is probably the best class I ever took anywhere, because I it was mind-blowing to me at the time. But what, what I think I realized afterwards was that I, just by seeing the three of you essentially, I, I got a real balanced and broad view of what feminism, I wasn't locked into a one particular way of looking at feminism, but there was the sort of more of a radical side, you and Carolee, and you know, there was a whole, and Kay, uh, Johnson. 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 Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but then Miriam and Panita, very no-nonsense, um, and, and grounding it in a context that I just, it really helped me um, when I graduated from here and started dealing with some of the real world feminist issues, realizing that A, there was no simple answers, but also that there was a much more encompassing um, world out there in feminism. So thank you all for, thank for being thankful. Yes, do you want to say anything? 
Or do you feel like this? <laughs> no, I'm enjoying this conversation. <coughs> or, is there anyone else? I think that we're, I know you all have to go to your humanities <laughs> panel. Yeah. And there are a couple of receptions. So well. I think we, um, we've come to the end.